welcome to this video on how to pass an appraisal. My name is Neil Potter and I have been appraising companies for over 30 years and today I'm going to discuss what an appraisal is and how to pass. The topic areas we'll discuss today are the models and what is required. So briefly, you know how well do you have to perform these things and what do you even have to do to be level two or level three. Uh, what is an appraisal? Uh, but about the sampling, uh, there is a sampling done of the organization. We don't look at everything for every project, so we'll discuss sampling. Uh, the appraisal team. Uh, appraisals uh, have a collaboration between myself, the lead appraiser, and the internal people from the company. Uh, we'll discuss that. Uh, the activities of an appraisal and the end result, the findings, rating, and publication of the results to the internet. Now, typically people are choosing between two models. Uh, one is the dev model uh, for development. You're building a product or a solution, maybe software, hardware, or a combination, IT. And then secondly, uh, the services model too. You're providing a service like a IT service or an accounting service or a coffee service. Uh, then the services model will be uh, the one to pick, pick. Now, among the two models, there are many common uh, practice areas and it's going to be unique ones too. Uh, unique ones, for example, are these ones here in the services ones. Uh, these are unique to this model. And if you look at the dev model, they're not in there. Now, every model is defined further uh, by practices. So these are the practice areas, uh, these topic areas here. And if you look at the document down here, you'll find each one is defined further, maybe into five, between five and 10 extra practices. And so companies or projects are performing those practices in their own implementation. So for example, if we take planning and estimation, if we're going to do our project, we're going to plan it out, estimate it uh, before we commit. And so you would have your own way to do planning and estimation. And in your process for doing that, we would find the practices of plan and estimation. So if you have a company or project lifecycle, which you've defined your way of doing business, then you're making sure these practices are embedded in the way you do your work. And therefore, when we do the appraisal, we can find how well you're doing uh, those practices. Now, you can't skip the practices of the model, except for SAM. If you have no suppliers, then you can declare SAM as not applicable, because there are no suppliers here. But every other practice area and practice has to be done. So you can't go to an appraisal and hope to pass if you are skipping things. Like if you look at uh, MC, uh, Monitor Control, and you skip the practice, you can't then declare I want to be level two or level three, uh, but I want to skip the practice. You have to do all the practices in your kind of own way. Now, there are efficient ways to do these things, which I have in other videos, uh, to kind of group things together and make things uh, very elegant. Now, your implementation may have different words, different terminology, uh, different language, a different kind of style than the style of the wording of the model, which is kind of fine. You could be agile and call things spikes and sprints and iterations and whatever. And maybe they don't use those words in the model. You can use your own language, your own style, your own implementation. But when we get to the appraisal, we can map things easily to kind of the back to the practices. So you want to make sure every practice has been done in a useful way for you, for your organization. That would be the expectation. Now, if you want to be uh, appraised at uh, ML3 or maturity level three, uh, then you have done all of the practice areas of level two and level three. Now, the intent, of course, is you are doing these things in a, an efficient kind of fashion and you're getting better results as a company, less mistakes, more efficiency, uh, better productivity, and you can measure that. But when we get to the appraisal point, then we can recognize and find how you're doing these things in your company. When I get to the point of preparing a company for level three of the appraisal, I do do a lot of checks myself on being ready, uh, that we will actually go through the practices and take a look at them informally before the appraisal and check they're kind of there. If you are missing stuff, and I can detect you're missing stuff, I recommend not appraising. Uh, I typically never appraise companies that are not gonna get the level they want to because I'm working with them beforehand to make sure they are ready. So not that I can guarantee everything is done perfectly because we don't, may, may not look at everything 
uh, in the informal appraisal, but I will do my best job to make sure we are kind of ready for the appraisal. If you know for sure there's a practice you have not done, or you skipped, or you avoided it, or you stopped doing it, uh, then that will be a, a flag, a red flag, and this says you're not ready yet. Uh, uh, with the exception of Sam, if you have no suppliers, then we expect you to do the practices correctly uh, in your implementation uh, for the appraisal. Now, not every practice or practice area has to be done equally well. Okay? Uh, you might have been doing planning estimation for a thousand years, and you do those very well all the time. It's kind of how you do your business. But maybe things like uh, PQA, uh, you've been doing for less time, and you're doing it pretty well, but not as well as doing planning and estimation. That's okay. As long as you are meeting the intent of the practices, and the practices of the model are being done, and I would say enough evidence is going to have been, been collected over the time, maybe three to six months, to kind of show how you are doing it now, although it may not be as strong or done as well as uh, some of them, uh, then you're still good to go uh, for the appraisal. Now, if you know for sure you have skipped a practice altogether, then we should declare that before the appraisal starts, have you fix it, and then delay the appraisal. You don't want to go into the appraisal having not done some of the practices. Uh, that will cause you to fail that particular practice area and that kind of level. So, for example, if you looked at TS, uh, Technical Solution, and you had not done one of the practices, uh, that means the best you could hope for in the appraisal is level two, because that would kill all of level three. You can't be level three or uh, maturity level three if you're skipping a practice in one of the practice areas. So you do want to make sure the practices are done well before you appraise. If you have any doubt about a practice and have you done it correctly, not or well enough for the appraisal, you want to contact your lead appraiser. Some lead appraisers, like me, are amazing. Okay, and we give you ideas and suggestions and point you to kind of sources and whatever and help you figure out what it kind of means to kind of do the practice kind of well and give you some things to consider as you do it. Some lead appraisers have no idea. And when you ask them a question, they have no idea. And so <laughs> Why are you working with these people? Uh, some believe they can't answer questions because that will be you know, crossing a boundary like they are now helping you out. Uh, completely false. Uh, lead appraisers can answer questions, they should, and basically give you ideas of what con to consider as you do it. Now, what they can't do is do the implementation for you and then be the appraiser for that implementation. Uh, that will be you know, crossing over the line. Uh, but I've been working with people for three decades, um, and if you have a difficulty with a question or a practice or whatever, I can point you to 15 ways that's been done elsewhere, and you can then kind of understand that and then come up with your own implementation. So yes, you should be able to ask your lead appraiser any question at any time for anything, and they should better get back with you. If they don't, why are you using them? So let's discuss what an appraisal actually is. An appraisal is a review, typically, of one to six projects. Now, maybe more than that sometimes, but uh, there's some sampling that goes on. Uh, we'll discuss in a couple of seconds, uh, where we look at the population of projects, and then pick some, and then basically appraise that selection. And we'll discuss that in the next slide. When we start the appraisal, uh, we look at objective evidence. So when people do planning, there's a plan. When they do estimation, there are estimates. When they do risk, there's a risk log. When they do design, there's a design log. When they do um, the uh, service delivery, uh, there's contracts and uh, tracking of the work in service delivery. So the artifacts are the natural output you create as a project or an organization as you do your process, and the process is implementing the practices of the model. So when we look at artifacts, they are just your natural output you will create every day uh, for the work you're doing, either for internal sharing, like a design or whatever, or maybe external kind of delivery uh, to a customer. That's part of the output we look at of you in the appraisal. Uh, that's part of the evidence. And then we have these in-depth discussions or interviews. And so to corroborate or to collaborate on that and figure out how things are being done, we have a lot of interviews in the appraisal uh, with management on their areas, uh, team leaders on their areas, 
like planning and estimation and uh, practitioners on their areas. So to fill in the details of you know, how people are going to do their work, to understand that, uh, we have several or many interviews in the appraisal. And so we, I work with people on the schedule to figure out kind of who does what, who's the planner, who's the estimator, who's the designer, who's the tester, who's the service delivery person. And we figure out the appropriate uh, uh, kind of match of the practices of the model and kind of, kind of typically who would uh, do that kind of thing in their own way and then better discuss that in the appraisal. So the evidence we're collecting for the appraisal is partly A, uh, the artifacts, and partly be the interview comments or interview data we collect in the appraisal itself. That's kind of what you want to aim at. So you'd want to have people in the organization be well trained how to do their work correctly. And, and when we get to the appraisal, they're discussing their job, day by day job. And then we're basically mapping back to the model to kind of see how that's kind of done. The interviewees don't have to learn the model. They have to learn their company implementation where there's already a mapping we're going to build between what you do as a company and what the model says. Okay, So we already have a mapping to kind of recognize things. Uh, they just need to live out the way they do their work and be proficient in that for their regular day job to be more, more you know, get, a better, get work done better over time. And then the appraisal team uh, maps beforehand and then recognizes the mapping in the appraisal. So when they're discussing how they do estimation or how they do design or how they do whatever, uh, we can find that stuff in the uh, artifacts and the, with their discussion. Now, there's also a collective appraisal team knowledge. Uh, when we do an appraisal, it is myself, the lead appraiser, and three or four of the client organization too. So, now I'm not making stuff up as I go along, or uh, over-interpreting things, or incorrectly interpreting things. I have an appraisal team put together from your company or your organization, which we'll discuss in a couple of seconds. And it is a collaboration between my view of the world from a senior my perspective and their view of the world from a organization perspective. So I actually recommend you have three or four of your company, one of me, a lead appraiser, uh, do the appraisal. Now you actually can have an appraisal team made up of external people, external to you, so me, the lead appraiser, and three other people from the streets that are qualified correctly. I don't recommend that. It is legal. You can do that. Um, I recommend they come from your company because you want knowledge and buy-in about how you're going to do your work. Okay. And so um, a pre team is put together and then we go through the appraisal. Now, the results of the appraisal are basically a PowerPoint presentation of the strengths and errors to improve. And you can have weaknesses and errors to improve and be okay. You can't have that many, but you can have some. And then the results are confidential. Uh, they are basically owned by you. So if you want to share the data with companies or customers, you can do that. If you don't, uh, that's the company's choice uh, after the appraisal. Now, in the appraisal planning activity, uh, we do sampling. So we don't look at every project for every practice area of the model. Uh, we come up with a sample. So, for example, before the appraisal takes place, maybe a month or two months before, typically two months before, I will work with the company and figure out uh, the list of projects. Okay. Maybe they have 11 projects, maybe less, maybe more. Uh, we look at the list. And then I submit those to the Institute uh, through a web system called CAS or CAS. And that system will then sample what to go look at. So this is a dev organization. Uh, they're being sampled for P1, project number one, uh, for integration activities. And they're being sampled for P1 uh, for TS. Okay? And then uh, for peer reviews, uh, P3 was sampled over here. So RS is random sample. And you just see out of the whole map here, uh, they weren't sampled for everything, uh, only where the orange squares were listed, uh, where there's a sample built by the CAS system. And that's what we're going to look at in the appraisal. Now, I can, as the lead appraiser, add things. I added some green squares here called add or addition. And if the client wants to kind of show more about what they're doing, because there's a weakness elsewhere, maybe there's a weakness under one of these areas here, and then those are, there's a weakness for whatever reason, they actually may suggest they add up here uh, to mitigate that weakness. Or if I think the random sampling is a bit too skimpy and too kind of lightweight, 
and I want to kind of see more stuff, I can add green squares to the chart. So then the appraisal schedule is based upon the green and the orange squares. Okay. Now you can uh, uh, critique the orange squares, the random sample ones, and if you really didn't like them, you can argue through me to the Institute and say, my rationale is, you no, know, this team was cancelled, this team was whatever, and they didn't do that area for whatever reason. If it's a really good rationale, like really good rationale, uh, you can then run run the random sample again. Uh, but typically, you don't people don't have a good rationale, and we stick with the first sample, okay. and then we kind of move the green squares around uh, the lead appraiser and the client uh, to kind of give a good balance for the uh, data being looked at. Now, I mentioned before the appraisal team or ATMs. Uh, this is something I like about the appraisal method and have done from the very beginning, um, <clears throat> uh, back over 30 years ago. It's not a lead appraiser does something to you, like an auditor. It is the lead appraiser does something with you as a collaboration. So there's always an appraisal team. I recommend strongly that it's from the internal inside the company. Uh, typically three is the minimum. Uh, three plus myself means four. That's the minimum uh, team size. We might have an extra person, a uh, fourth person. I like myself to have small teams, whether well, it's big teams. And so the, the, here are the cre team criteria uh, for how to select the team. And I kind of work with the company uh, to help select the team. Uh, the first thing is that there's some experience requirements. Okay in the first uh, set of bullets here and you can't have people out of college and say i want to be a leader i want to be an appraisal team member because uh, they may not have seen enough stuff to recognize good and bad stuff in the appraisal so there are some minimal experience numbers uh, these ones here that you have to qualify for and we're going to work with you on that so i have a spreadsheet and we kind of put down the names of the people their years of experience and kind of doing that kind of work and then kind of see if we qualify to be a team member and then we have to have them trained in the version two of the model so there's a three-day course you take uh, with a lead appraiser uh, on the model itself you have to take that course uh, i use that at the very beginning of the cycle of your journey to figure out kind of where you are so i have a unique way to deliver the course uh, that is we basically treat the course as a gap analysis at the same time so it's like a kickoff meeting for the whole journey and we do a gap analysis and some other things in there too. Uh, actually, a lot of things in there. Uh, more than the regular default generic course you can get elsewhere. And so when we uh, do that class, uh, we are at least training the appraisal team members. Now, I recommend other people going to show up for the class too. Managers, uh, other team members, other project people to know what's going on. But at least in that population, in the class students, you have the ATM. So they're qualified before the appraisal. So typically I recommend uh, this would be the first thing you ever do, uh, gonna get going. And then there's an exam. I help people prepare for the exam. Uh, they're basically given 30 days initially uh, to take it. Uh, they have to be qualified too, so it's based upon the model and what we learn in the class. Um, then we get to the appraisal team itself and the appraisal. And the appraisal, no observers. So when we put the team together, you can't suggest, well, our CEO says that she would like to observe or he would like to observe the appraisal. They're just going to kind of sit on the sideline and be like a fly on the wall. Like, no, no, they're either part of the team or they're not part of the team. There's no observer, observer on the team here to kind of report back to corporate headquarters what's going on. Uh uh, doesn't happen. Uh, the sponsor, not on the team. Uh, typically, the sponsor is the senior manager. He or she may be the VP, the director, the CEO, or whoever. Uh, of the group being appraised. Uh, they are not on the team. Uh, similarly, other managers too. Uh, typically, we are trying to avoid having uh, people of power and control on the appraisal team because uh, that would change who says kind of what and how people are going to say things. And so we are typically looking at practitioner level people. They're going to want to be there, uh, know about the company, how it operates, kind of senior developer, senior tester, uh, could be a senior PM or a PM from another project that wasn't selected. Uh, but we're going to work with you to figure out a good set of team members that are going to meet the criteria. Um, <clears throat> and then we don't have people that are the entirety of the going to write the processes. So if you are getting new to this or you're new to this 
and you basically have process owners on the team, I would at least have another developer, tester, service provider, or whatever on the team to kind of balance it out. I wouldn't have just the process people on the team. Now, a lot of companies who I actually do have process people on the team, and uh, I'm the objective person. We have a, like another person uh, on the team too to kind of balance it out. And then I actually mitigate that conflict of interest other ways too to kind of have other people be interviewed uh, for their kind of work. So you can actually have process people there. It's okay. Uh, but we need more than just kind of that. So I recommend a balance between practitioners, maybe a process person there too. And then we're going to make a team of three to four people out of that. So the basic flow of events, we define the scope of the appraisal, maybe a particular division, a particular project, a particular line of work being appraised, not the whole company. So we'll work with you on that. And then when we get uh, that list figured out of projects, uh, we get a random sample done. That's typically done uh, 60 days uh, before the appraisal start date. That's kind of the earliest we can do it. Now we can scope and discuss things way before that to give you an idea of where you stand. Uh, but we can't get the sampling done, uh, the pretty green and uh, orange squares, until 60 days before day one. And then when the sample is done, I then build a schedule. Uh, the schedule is very, very detailed. My schedules are uh, typically hour by hour, kind of what we're going to do. And typically for a, a kind of a, a group of people, 50 people, it could be like a five day schedule. If it's less than 50 people, maybe 10, 15 people. It could be a three to four day schedule. And if it's maybe into 300 we're going to arrange people for the organization, it could be like a seven to eight day schedule. So the schedules look the same, but they're going to have just more activity going on uh, with a large organization, larger sample. So I will work with the company to figure out the schedule, uh, who, who's interviewed for kind of what topic area, uh, given the sample we have out of our uh, sampling. And then you prepare for the appraisal, you collect artifacts, the natural byproducts of what being done. We figure out who to interview and put them out, their names in the schedule uh, template. And then when the appraisal starts, on a day one of the appraisal over here, uh, we go through artifact review. Now, if you're nervous about that, we do some of that uh, high level artifact review beforehand, as we're going to figure out what artifacts you even have and what we should look at. We don't score or grade anything back then. We kind of just identify kind of what it is. So there's no guesswork on that. Uh, in the appraisal, we do artifact review and actually you're going to look at things. Now, if there are gaps and problems by that point, you can't fix them because we are started the appraisal by that point. A gap is a gap and just you have to live with the gap. Uh, hope it's not kind of too bad. So you want to fix the gaps beforehand. Then we do interviews, typically one to, two, one to three days of interviews. Uh, given how big the sample is. Uh, again, the questions are about how you do your work. They're based upon the practices of the model, but they're not, a, not, they're not in the language or the wording of the model. We ask you, how do you estimate? How do you estimate effort? How do you put a schedule together? How do you assess risk? Where do you assess risk? Okay. So basically, I paraphrase the model into regular English speak um, and ask questions in a way you would understand about how you do your work. Interviewees obviously respond with gonna, I do this, I do that or whatever. Um, they should be doing it by that point. Um, and then after that, we put together these findings. Uh, basically it's a summary PowerPoint uh, listing of what we thought was done particularly well and where there may be gaps or weaknesses. Uh, then you get to uh, critique that, that's kind of the preliminary here. And so we show the company or the interviewees a draft copy of that before the rating activity. So after we have got our data together in PowerPoint, like a summary level, we then show the organization, we think you said this, is that right? Or we think you said that, is that kind of right? And you can critique us, the, critique the appraisal team. After that, the appraisal team then does rating. We have decided if you're level one, two, three, or whatever the uh, target is. And then the last day of the appraisal, we do a final findings presentation. So typically there isn't much change between the preliminary round and the final round. There could be a few things we had to discover and, and fix and whatever, uh, correct. But then we do a final briefing and that final briefing then includes the rating too. Uh, nobody knows about the rating until the last day of the appraisal. And then after the last day of the appraisal, I submit the results 
uh, to the Institute and they do a audit or review of my stuff. Okay. Uh, they do a that of everybody's stuff when they submit. Now, uh, a long time ago, the Institute used to take between one and five days to do their review. And then they went up to 60 days. Okay. And then suddenly, maybe recently, they came down to one to five days again. Okay. Um, I would say the average would be, who knows okay, what the average is? What are they doing? I don't know. I would say the average would be 30 days. Okay. I think their target is to be 30 days or less, although they have been all over the place. Okay. And so I would say within 30 days or less, they should then bless the appraisal results and then you can then publish it. Uh, you can't publish the result until they kind of bless it. Um, and the, you can either publish it or not. Uh, you go to this website. It's kind of where I put the results up there uh, for you uh, through the Institute's kind of web system. And so if you want to have it published to the world, and I'm just kind of the rating and the summary, you can do that. If the sponsor does not want to do that for some reason, it's a valid appraisal, but they don't want to tell anybody, uh, then they don't have to tell anybody. I've only had a couple of examples of that over the years where the company I was appraising was level two, but their competitors were level four. And so they didn't want to tell everybody, hey guys, we're level two. Um, and then have people kind of find their competitors were level four. Uh, most people do actually publish their results on the website. And then number four, if needed, if you actually did go through the appraisal and there were some gaps which we didn't detect beforehand and it caused you to kind of fail the appraisal, not get the level you wanted to get, uh, then actually you can make a request for an APR. An APR is basically you fix the gaps maybe the three or four gaps, five gaps you have, and then we appraise just those gaps, and then you can add the result of that, the, the, the rating of that, uh, back to the previous appraisal we just kind of finished. So it's a, like a delta patch appraisal you could do. You have to get permission to do this uh, from the Institute. Uh, I think it's only a handful of gaps you can have. There's actually even a calculation of how many gaps or practices that weren't satisfied. And if you're within that threshold, maybe a handful, 10, 11, 15, whatever, uh, then you can qualify for the APR, do the APR. Now, I try to avoid this altogether. I try to work with you. I do work with you. I insist upon working with you beforehand to make sure there are no gaps. I can't be, I can't guarantee that, but I go out of my way to make sure there are no gaps before we appraise. And so uh, when you appraise, the likelihood is that gaps have been resolved and detected beforehand, and we should be good can't guarantee that, but we should be good. There's always a surprise or it could be a surprise in the appraisal, but on the whole, I'm pretty thorough and uh, we're, we're pretty uh, aware of kind of what's going on. Sometimes what you don't know is what people are going to say in the interviews. You know, we can look at artifacts all day long, but if the guy says in the interview, I don't do this, I don't want to do it, I never do it, okay, then you may not know that was in his or her head, okay, and was going to spill out or fall out, okay. And so I can't detect that either. Uh, but on the whole, uh, typically, uh, readiness reviews are pretty thorough and, uh, and we're kind of good to go. So the result of the appraisal, you have the findings, their PowerPoint, uh, every topic area is kind of listed, and the strengths, weaknesses, and areas to improve. You actually can have some weaknesses and be okay. I wouldn't have that many. And I would check with the lead appraiser beforehand what the weaknesses typically would be or what are, what they are, uh, just to kind of see how weak weak actually is. And I do encourage my appraisal teams to kind of look for suggestions for making things more efficient over time for after the appraisal. You get a rating chart at the end. So part of the PowerPoint is the rating chart. They're going to have all the topic areas listed on the columns and kind of the practices down here. And then kind of green is good. It could be yellow or green. Um, green is fully met and yellow is largely met. So you can have a, a chart of some greens, a lot of greens and a few yellows. Uh, you can't have below that, but you get a chart at the end. And then if you decide to, on the website, you get a, rate, a kind of a summary rating uh, showing you at a very, very high level uh, that you can go then go public with that link uh, later on. Now, there's more. Okay, there's always more. I'm giving you a 10, 15 minute video here. I've been doing this for over three decades. There's more, there really is more. Okay. 
If you want to know what Neil thinks a good implementation of level 3 and level 2 are, then you could go to the class here and uh, take the class. There's one on level, one on dev, and one on services uniquely. Okay, go to the link and take a look. Yes, there's a little fee for that. Okay, little fee. It's actually you're going to spend one company hour, the cost of that company hour, and you may save months of time. Okay, so if the fee you pay for the class, the little fee you pay for the class, is more than you can afford. I can't help you. I'm sorry about that. As cheap as I can get it. Okay. Um, there's some free ones out there too. Uh, there's a video, a YouTube video, on comparing Pinbook, ISO, Sumamaya, and Agile Scrum. There's one on compliance versus intent. Uh, there's one on using a consistent process. Okay. I think there's an article there. And there's one on maintaining the gains. Okay. So there's quite a few things out there. There's just a handful. Over the last 25, 30 years, I've put together either free videos on YouTube or some articles there too. Thanks for watching the video. If you have any questions on any aspects of what we covered, appraisals, models, practices, lead appraisals, teams, whatever you want, anything, okay, send me an email, question, text, whatever you like, post a comment down below, and I'll be happy to get back with you.